It's been a, a difficult week, just to say the least, in our, in our country, in Lake County here, in our area. As we think about what's going on around us, um, it just it reminds me to think about this warning that we have here. Warning. Your words reveal who you really are. I'm just going to let that sink in for a minute. Your words reveal who you really are. You know, the things that we say have, I believe, a deeper meaning than, than what we think about. We, we tend to just kind of say things off the cuff. And if you were to really sit back and listen to your words, I wonder if they're words that bring unity or division. You know, I think about in my own home, Dawn and I, we have a reputation of not being able to work on the same project together. <laughs> you know, Dawn and I can look at just about any project you can think of, and both of us have our own idea of how we should do that project. You know, if it's painting, she would start on one side of the wall and I would start on the other. Or she would go back and forth and I would go up, or just whatever it is. You know, I'd, I use the dishwasher a lot of times, and it's funny because if you ever pull the tray out on the dishwasher, all it really is is a bunch of sticks sticking up. I've never tried to figure this out, but I would guess there are probably a hundred different ways you could load a dishwasher. But in my mind, there is a way to load the dishwasher. And guess what? That is not the way Don loads the dishwasher. So us loading the dishwasher together is not a good idea. And there, there are some words of Christ that address this that we will get to later. But, but I'm going I'm to take it a little bit bigger than just my home. What about our church family? Is it unity or division? Now, you know as well as I do that churches have been divided over little things, silly things. Today, for instance, we are using these masks right here. And are we all on the same page with why we're using the masks? I mean, the reason we're really using these masks is, is to say to someone, I care about you. I don't want to give you the virus, so I'm going to wear a mask so that I don't get you sick in case I have it. Now, do I think this mask is going to keep me from getting the virus? No, be, because honestly, nothing is covering my eyes. I'm not wearing that mask so that I don't get sick. I'm wearing the mask to say to each one of you that I care about you, and I don't want to give you something that I might have. But it goes bigger than just our family and our church. Think about the city in which we live. Just this past week, we've had all kinds of things going on, from demonstrations to People who are concerned about one thing or another. You know, as, as long as I can remember, thinking back, we've always been fighting over colors. It used to be black and white. And now it's black and blue. And it doesn't matter what words you choose to use, those words will be twisted. If you stand there and say, black lives matter, someone will twist those words into saying that you hate police officers and vice versa. The words that we choose to use, we have to be very careful. Are they words of unity or are they words 
of division. Now think about the state level. I grew up in a state that, as, as far as I am aware of, there is not another state in our union that takes college football as seriously as the state of Alabama. You literally, when you move there, you have to pick a side. You're either Alabama or Auburn. And if you say you're for Alabama, that means to everyone in that state who's an Auburn fan, you hate Auburn, and vice versa. Our words have meaning. Think about our country. It used to be, and not long ago, because I can remember it well, when we were all Americans. We believed this was the greatest country on the globe, and I still believe that. Amen. Despite all the stuff that's going on in our country today. But now, if you say you're for a particular person and they're of a particular party, then those words mean you hate everyone in the other party. Are they words of unity or words of division? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to camp out in Matthew chapter 12 today and see what our Lord and Savior has to say to us. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. It says, Then a demon-possessed man was blind and mute, and he was brought to Jesus, and Jesus healed him, so that the mute man both spoke and saw. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 is where I am. So here they are. They're, they bring this deaf and mute person to Jesus. And Jesus heals him. He can now speak. He can now hear. You would think that the reaction is, praise be to God. A miracle has just taken place. If, every, if we could just stop what really happened here and rewrite it and say, oh, everybody was celebrating and they were all on the same page and it was a beautiful testimony to the community of the unity of the people of God. Be that'd be a beautiful story, wouldn't it? That is not what happened. Jesus heals a deaf and mute person. Deaf and blind, sorry. Verse 23, And all the crowds were amazed, and they were saying, This man can't be the son of David, can he? Now, now what they're saying is, this, this couldn't be the Messiah, could it? Because they know, all these good Jews, they know that the Messiah is to be a descendant of King David. And they're saying, Is this the Messiah? He just healed this man right in front of us. Is this the Messiah? Verse 24, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. Now let me push pause. The Pharisees, just as a reminder, this is one of the religious leader groups in Israel. The Pharisees made up a, a large number of the people on the Sanhedrin. They thought they were the rulers of the area. They, along with the Sadducees, the, those two groups had some theological disagreements, another division. But these guys are the religious leaders. Here comes Jesus into town. He heals this person. The whispers in the crowd are, is this the Messiah? And the Pharisees begin to tell everybody, this guy casts out demons by the power of the ruler of the demons. Wow. 
I'm just letting that one sink in for a second. Jesus is casting out demons by the power of Satan. That's what they're saying. Now, does that make any sense to anybody? Let, let me try to put it in my kind of thinking. That would be like if in a few months they actually start playing college football again and we're watching the UCF Golden Knights football team and they're lined up on offense and every time they hike the ball, one of the players on the offense tackles the guy with the ball. Is there any chance UCF is going to win this game? That would be ridiculous, by the way. I would hope that the coach would pull that player out after the first time he did it. But let's just be ridiculous and imagine the guy left the player in. And the whole game was like that. The Pharisees are saying, Jesus just got rid of a demon, exercised a demon out of someone by the power of Satan. Verse 25. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. Let me rephrase that for you. Any kingdom that is divided against itself will be laid in ruin. Any football team that's tackling its own offensive players is going to be ruined. He doesn't stop by just saying kingdom. Look at the rest of what he says here. Any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Now let's just ponder, who, who is Jesus talking about here? Pharisees. He's talking to the Pharisees, but I'm going to submit to you, he's probably talking about his own disciples here. His disciples are all Jews. They would be the sons of Israel. They too have been going around casting out demons. So if Jesus is casting out demons by the power of Satan, then so too are all of the disciples of Jesus. And he goes on. For this reason... They will be your judges. Let me just ask you a question. Who, by whose power, is Jesus really casting out demons? Okay, this is sort of a trick question, so I want you to think it over. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on him. And it was in the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus went out and did these miracles. Jesus is casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Pharisees just said, no, it's not the Holy Spirit of God. It is the prince of demons by whom you cast out demons. Now, hopefully you have a problem with that. I mean, if, if the Pharisees were here, we would have our own riot. And I would probably be the instigator of it. These guys are calling the work of the Holy Spirit the work of Satan himself. Verse 28, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man, then 
he will plunder his house. And Jesus is directly talking about Satan here. Who's the strong man? It's Satan. You can't go in the strong man's house and plunder his property without first binding the strong man, Satan. And if that's what's really going on here, Pharisees, then the kingdom of God is upon you. Jesus is the son of David, just as the crowd has started to whisper. Could this be the Messiah? Yes, absolutely it is. The kingdom of God is here. Demons are being cast out by the power of the Holy Spirit. And here are the religious leaders in Israel saying, oh, no, no, that's by the power of of the ruler over all of the demons. How ridiculous. Jesus says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. A city divided against itself. A country divided against itself. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So I ask you a question. In our own city and kingdom and country, are we united or are we divided? And if we're divided, what is the solution to that division? We'll get to that in a minute. Jesus is saying things that are against themselves will be left in ruin. They will be destroyed. They can't stand. And then he goes into a commonly misunderstood part of the Scripture. So let's take a close look at it here. Starting in verse 30. Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. This is commonly called the unforgivable sin. And people spend probably too much time concerning themselves about whether they have committed the unforgivable sin or not. So let's take a, cl a close look at what is the unforgivable sin here. It is calling something that is obviously the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of Satan. Let me say that again. It's calling something that is obviously the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of Satan. You're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And I would stand here and argue that no believer in Christ would do that. You're not going to see something that is obviously the work of the Holy Spirit and then attribute that to the prince of demons. It's not going to happen. Who just did that, by the way? The Pharisees. Now, do you think... I mean, just, just use your sanctified imagination with me for a second. Do you think the Pharisees are concerned that they just did that? No. I bet they don't even care. Why? Because they're not believers, right? Th those guys are evil. I mean... Yes, your pastor just said the religious leaders in Israel are evil. Let, let that sink in. The Pharisees are evil. They just called the work of the Holy Spirit the work of Satan, and they could care less. Jesus is speaking to this multitude, and he's saying 
This is the unforgivable sin. You can blaspheme me, Jesus says. Blaspheme Jesus all you want to. That will be forgiven. But blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That will never be forgiven. And I don't believe that you as a believer or any other believer would ever do that. When you see something that is obviously the work of the Holy Spirit, we would never attribute that to Satan. But these guys, being desperately wicked, not only did it, but they don't care that they did it. Attributing something that is obviously the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan himself. So let's look at what our words do. Jesus continues here in verse 33. He says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. Now this word bad here kind of has the connotation of being diseased. So if you think about what's going on around us in, in Florida, every now and then we'll have a batch of orange trees that get a disease on them. And then the fruit is bad. And that's what's going on here. So if you've got a bad tree, a diseased tree, then the fruit is no good to eat. And how do you know that your trees have a disease? The fruit. You know them by their fruit. Jesus is saying that. He's using that as an illustration to point out, you're going you're gonna to see people. People are good. People are bad. You're going to know them by their fruit. Just like a diseased tree. Just like the orange trees that we have in our area that get diseased and need to be uprooted. Jesus goes on. I love what he says next. You brood of vipers. Now remember, he's talking to the Pharisees. And in case you don't know what a brood of vipers is, that is the offspring of snakes. Okay, try that for, you know, when, when you want to have a conversation with somebody, just call them the offspring of snakes and see how that goes for you. Here is Jesus talking to the Pharisees directly, and he calls them, I mean, he had to have a sense of humor. I mean, I know he did because he made me, but I mean, this is hilarious to me. He's talking to the religious leaders in Israel, and he calls them the offspring of snakes. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. Where, where is that treasure? It's in, inside the man. It's in his heart. So as a good man is speaking, he's speaking from this good treasure that's inside of him. Kind of like that tree. You'll know them by their fruit. Good people, they speak from the treasure of goodness inside of them, and their speech is good. Jesus is saying, these Pharisees are wicked. The only thing they can say is evil, because they're evil people. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. The evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that everyone, every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Your words expose the real you. Your words are like the fruit on the tree. They expose what is on the inside of you, whether that is good, whether that is evil. The Pharisees exposed themselves with their words. They took what was obvious to everyone present 
something that the Holy Spirit had done, and by their words, they attributed it to Satan himself. Their words exposed them. Jesus called them evil because of the words they spoke. It revealed who they really were. The good people who were there were revealed by the things that they were saying. They were whispering things like, could this be the son of David? I mean, a miracle has just taken place in front of us. This man's been healed. A, a demon has been cast out. Pharisees' words is really all that was needed to reveal, to expose, and ultimately to hang them. Jesus said, in the end, it will be your words, whether you are justified or condemned at the judgment. It will be your own words that reveal who you really are. And it begs some questions for us. What do our words say about us? Just like when we began this little conversation here about what's going on in our community. When you say Black Lives Matter, that gets twisted into you hate the police officers and vice versa. So what is it that your words are saying to people? Are you an FSU fan and all of the Gainesville loyals feel like you hate them? I mean, I'm being very facetious here. Luke's nodding back there. The, the reality is our words are much more serious than that. What is it that our words are saying about us? Because they're coming from that treasure inside of us, and we're speaking to people. What does that say about us? Are we people of unity? Are, are we trying to reunite this community, reunite the people in our congregation, reunite the people in our house, in our state, in our country? Are we adding to the division? Are we part of the problem? Or are we sitting on the sidelines as a spectator doing nothing? What do our words say about us? There is unity and there is division. And I would submit to you this morning that our country is in desperate need of unity. Amen. There is division all around us. And we don't have time to go there, but we could read further and find out the source of unity is the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is the Holy Spirit that unites us. I think about people who have come to our country from other places. Alex de Tocqueville comes to mind, Frenchman. He came here, toured America, came to this conclusion. America is great because America is good. And what he was saying is, it is a great country because the people who live here are good people. But then he said this, if America ever ceases to be good... America will cease to be great. Uh-oh. I mean, we're right there. So what is the remedy for our country? What is the remedy for the division in our country? What is the remedy for us to return to good and not be lost in the sea of evil forever. The remedy is sitting in this room. You and I are witnesses 
bearers of the gospel. And we're either going out in this community and creating unity or we're creating division or we're sitting on the sidelines as a spectator doing nothing. And our words are going to expose us for who we are. There is a day coming when our words will either justify us or they will condemn us. Out of the treasure of what is inside you and me, we're speaking into the lives of the people in our community. And what are those words saying? Are we sharing with them the everlasting life that is available through Jesus Christ? Are we sharing with them a better way to know Christ and to live forever and to live in unity now and forever? Or are we just part of the problem? I mean, it's real easy to click on the TV and listen to what everybody else is saying and then just regurgitate that. Is that what we're doing? Jesus called us to be different. He called us to be a peculiar people. That's not a comfortable thing to be. It's not comfortable to go out in this community and be the oddball. I think about Jesus when he was here. He was definitely the oddball. And here's the crazy thought for us to wrap our mind around. He is the model that we are to live by. He came here, took on human flesh, and lived among us to show us how to live. We are supposed to be imitators of Christ. <laughs> I mean, this is cliche, but what would Jesus do? Would he be sitting on the sidelines right now doing nothing? Would he be regurgitating the division in our community and perpetuating the problem? Or would he be going out there and making a difference and trying to unite this country, make it good again? Because the reality is the sickness, the disease that the tree has in this country is a spiritual disease. Amen. Yeah. And we have the remedy. Yes, we do. It's as if we have the vaccine to what's ailing everyone and we're just going to keep it in our pocket for ourselves. I'm safe. Is that what we're supposed to do? This country needs to be united. This country is in desperate need. What are our words saying about us? Unity, division, blasphemy. Is the treasure within us, is that good or evil? I mean, I hate to even bring this up, but if we recorded ourselves and went back and watched that, what would that say about us? I almost had on our little warning sign that I started with a video camera, just for fun, because it seems like everywhere you go, you're being recorded these days. What if we had to go back and watch those tapes? What would you, after watching it, wish you had done or said differently? Jesus came here and he gave us a mission. And that mission was to go out into our community and be his witness everywhere we go. And it's so easy in this culture to just... I'm just going to keep my mouth closed. I don't want to stir up any trouble. 
I'm just going to go do my thing. Stealth mode. Nobody needs to know I'm a Christian. I'm going to get in, get out, and get home where I'm safe. Got the vaccine right here, but keeping it from me. Jesus wants us to be different. He wants us to be peculiar. He wants us to be salt and light in this community. And there's a silly little children's song that says, do you, you, know, do you hide it under a bushel? No! The kids get it. But that's exactly what we do. I'm guilty. It's easy to just go home and hang out with the family. It's easy to just come here and hang out with you guys. Well, no feathers being ruffled. We all are like-minded. That's not what Jesus is calling us to do. We're in a difficult period of time in this country, and I think every one of you recognize that. And it is no mistake that you and I are on planet Earth right now in the Leesburg area, that was all strategy because there's a mission before us. What are our words saying about us? And please don't forget, our words will either justify us or they will condemn us. So I would invite you to pray and strive for unity. Unity in our community. We have the remedy, and we need to go out of this building and share it with other people. Let's take a moment, make some decisions, and pray, and ask God to be with us in the midst of all this. If you'd like to come and pray at the altar, now's a good time to do that. Let's pray together.